baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 3 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. We're excited because we have a special guest with us this evening, the current General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International, Bishop David K. Bernard, calling in by phone uh, from UPCI headquarters there in St. Louis, Missouri. Bishop Bernard, how are you this afternoon? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the program. Absolutely. Well, we want to uh, get you to take just a moment Introduce yourself to our listeners. Uh, tell them a little bit about your educational background, uh, areas of study, and some of your ministerial uh, experience for those of our listeners that may not be familiar with you. All right. I'll be happy to do so. I was raised in Korea where my parents were missionaries. I came back to the U.S. at age 17 to go to college. And uh, so I have uh, as far as my educational background, I have a bachelor's degree in mathematical sciences and managerial studies from Rice University in Houston. I have a master's and doctorate of theology, um, and I have um, a doctor of jurisprudence, which is a law degree from the University of Texas because I was going to become a lawyer. But God changed my direction, and I've been a full-time minister for 40 years. Uh, some of the things I've done, my wife and I started a church in Austin, Texas. And I pastored there for 18 years, uh, grew the church to about 1,000, and we started 16 other churches out of that one. Uh, I also uh, started Urshan College and Urshan Graduate School of Theology, served as the president there for about 18 years, uh, guiding those two schools to accreditation. And for the last 12 years, I've been the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International. Uh, we have about, uh, well, over 42,000 churches worldwide in 198 nations and 34 territories. So I stay pretty busy traveling um, across the world and especially here in the U.S. and Canada. And and so I'm happy to be able to talk to you and your listeners today. Well, we do appreciate having you. Uh, We know you're a busy man, but we also felt it was very important uh, to uh, speak with you concerning some of the uh, social things that, that are going on. Uh, around the world, uh, politics, the COVID uh, crisis, and, and many other things. And so we wanted you to kind of talk to our listeners for a little bit and, and give some insight and uh, some direction uh, concerning some of these things. Uh, let me ask you this. As Christians, uh, can you discuss for a few moments a few moments with our listeners the importance of of a proper and biblical Christian response to the world around us. You know, things such as current events, social climate, politics. How important is it that we maintain our Christian integrity uh, in our response uh, to these things that are going on? Well, it's certainly important for us to be relevant and engaged in our society. We can't just stand aloof and ignore what's going on around us. But neither can we just succumb to the cultural trends of the day. But first of all, we must be biblical. We must establish our values from the Word of God. Uh, That's our priority. That's our supreme authority. And then based on that, we need to uh, apply the teachings of Scripture to our daily lives. And we need to be a witness to the secular world around us of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there must be a balance between engaging our society and uh, not compromising the truths that we believe are from the Word of God. The vaccine has been a very hot topic among uh, Christians. Uh, I've taken the vaccine, and I believe that you have also taken uh, a form of the vaccine. But many Christians uh, refuse to take the vaccine. Uh, Many associate the vaccine with things like the mark of the beast or 
uh, any of the uh, other uh, conspiracy theories that are out there. What are your thoughts on Christians participating in the propagation of that kind of narrative uh, concerning the vaccine? Uh, is there any well, biblical basis for it? Uh, and oh, does it have the potential to hurt the kingdom of God? Well, I, I think the key is balance. Now, now first of all, uh, I think it's a personal choice as whether someone wants to take the vaccine or not. And as far as Christians are concerned, Romans 14 should apply. We have Christian liberty, so we shouldn't be attacking and condemning one another for our personal choices. Uh, I do think if we become extreme in one area or if we promote um, statements that are false or at least rumors that are highly suspect, then we can hurt our credibility. Uh, and I do think we have a responsibility to good, good citizens in our society. So looking specifically at the vaccine, first of all, in principle, there's nothing wrong with a vaccine. Uh, we've used them for hundreds of years. Um, the smallpox vaccine uh, in, ended a deadly disease that took 300 million lives in the 20th century. So, um, you know, we've used them for years. I've taken many vaccines over my life. Growing up in Korea, I probably wouldn't have survived uh, without those vaccines, including smallpox. And as I've traveled in over 100 nations of the world, even today, many nations require vaccines such as yellow fever in order to have entrance into their country. Um, so we, we have to say there's nothing wrong with using medical science and uh, and using the body's own immune system to fight against diseases, which is essentially what a vaccine does. Now, there are, are some ethical concerns. Um, some modern vaccines are created using um, uh, human cell lines that descended from aborted fetuses. And obviously, we're against abortion, and we're against any research that would use um, the results of abortion. Actually, um, the two vaccines available here in the U.S. for COVID-19 use a completely different technology that don't use any human cell lines. So that particular issue is not really at the forefront. Uh, others have said it's the mark of the beast, but if you read Scripture, Revelation 13, the mark of the beast is associated with a knowing, deliberate choice to worship uh, this false leader that is often called the Antichrist. And obviously no one has asked uh, us to do that in taking the vaccine. So if you're taking scripture literally, no, it couldn't be the mark of the beast. Now, there are many other theories and people say, well, it could lead to that. Well, so can computers, so can um, video technology, the internet, all these things have the potential for being used to fulfill end time prophecy in a negative way. Universal product codes, uh, chips, uh, cell phones, um, some are worried about being tracked. Well, if you have a cell phone, you have the potential of being tracked. So I think we have to be reasonable and balanced here. And just because technology can be misused doesn't mean we exclude all, all technology. Now, if someone is conscientiously opposed, that's their choice. But it shouldn't be a matter of condemnation or false information or uh, scare tactics or rumor mongering that is not justified because, again, um, even if we personally don't think we need or want the vaccine, there are a lot of people that are high risk and we don't need to pressure them or scare them. They need to be able to make informed decisions for their own health, even as we want that same privilege for ourselves. Amen. Politics can be very divisive, uh, especially in the church. Uh, can you give some advice on what the appropriate uh, Christian response and behavior should be concerning politics, uh, endorsing political parties, or even uh, individual candidates? Oh, well, let's look at this from two perspectives. First of all, individual Christians. I think we have a right and even a responsibility to be engaged in our society. Of course, in the first century, uh, in the Bible days, uh, the Bible lands were ruled by the Roman Empire. They did not have democracy. They did ha not have the opportunities that we do. But in America, we do have opportunities. And so I think as citizens, we should be engaged. We should pray. We should vote. Uh, we should express our convictions and beliefs. So on a personal level, it's fine to promote a political candidate or party or be part of a party or hold a government office 
and so on. I think we should always do so with integrity, and uh, we can't be l- blindly loyal to any party or any candidate if they have shortcomings, uh, particularly that go against Christian ethics. We, we have to be free to say, I don't agree with that, I don't approve of that. Now, that's on an individual level. Now, as a church, officially, I don't think we should promote political parties or candidates. The number one reason is the church needs to be open to everyone. We want everyone to be saved, everyone to come to church, and we don't want to create unnecessary barriers where somebody will say, well, I can't go to that church because they promote a certain party, or I wouldn't be welcome there, or I couldn't be involved in leadership there because they're aligned with a certain candidate. So we don't want to create a stumbling block uh, that would inhibit the gospel. Uh, and, and also, of course, under U.S. law, we could lose our tax-exempt status if we promote candidates and parties. Uh, so I don't think that as, as churches, I don't think we should do that. However, even as churches, we can and should promote moral values, and we should speak on issues that are important to our society. So I do think the church should be speaking up through preaching, through teaching, through even political activity or engagement through nonprofit organizations. Um, We should uh, stand up for things such as um, democracy and most of all religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, economic freedom, free markets, um, and other values. Of course, we stand against abortion, we stand for marriage, we stand for families, um, and we stand for b- biblical teachings in, in, in this regard. Uh, in a secular society, a pluralistic society, we can't necessarily implement everything that we think to be God's will, and, and maybe it's not even advisable to try to enforce moral law in certain ways, but, it, but when it comes to values of, that drive our laws and that upon which our nation is supported, no, we can and should stand up for those moral values. So I believe as the church, we've got to be careful uh, not to be partisan or um, indebted to any political party. We need to uh, have the freedom and independence to, to speak what we think is right, regardless of what anybody else says. Uh, it's important for us um, to pre- preserve that moral independence that we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with credibility uh, to everyone. And I would just finally add, going back to the personal level, while I said, yes, we have the right to be involved, but I think as Christians, especially those who are leaders, we may have a right, but we should also consider our responsibility. So I present my views on social media, and they're conservative. And I could, if I wanted to, I think I have the right to to say, I support this candidate, this party. But I refrain from that, not because I don't have a right, but because I don't want to close off my influence with people I'm trying to lead towards the Lord. So I would just suggest as individual pastors or even lay leaders in a local church, consider you might have the right to say some things personally, but do you want to spend your influence that way? Or do you want your, to save your influence in order to try to lead people to Christ and lead people to the church? So it's a matter of using wisdom as to what's going to be most effective. Do I want to spend my influence trying to convince them to vote for a certain candidate uh, and, and maybe exclude half the population from listening to anything else I have to say? Or do I, I want to save my influence to bring them to the gospel? So that's a pragmatic consideration that each pastor and each church has to take into account for themselves. I agree with that. Uh in totality. Um, I think it is very important, uh, especially in the way of using social media. It it seems that many times we can get carried away uh, and we can forget uh, that 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 influence uh, is is very important and uh, we can turn people away from from the gospel uh, with uh, political rhetoric. Um, what are your thoughts concerning, uh, the illegal immigration crisis at the border? I know that you have stated, uh, that you have been down and you visited, uh, the border. You know, it's a hot topic in the news, uh, but many of our churches, 
are, are dealing with this illegal immigration issue. Many are, are having revival in the Hispanic community. So a, as Christians, uh, in reaching out and attempting to save these people, uh, what, what do you consider, uh, the proper response? What are your thoughts on, uh, how we deal uh, with illegal immigrants and sharing the gospel. Uh, again, let me give you a twofold answer. First of all, let me speak as an, an American citizen. Um, I love our country. It's certainly not a perfect country, but people are coming from, from all over the world because of our freedom and economic opportunity. And so we've got to have a system. I believe as a nation, we should have reasonable laws, I think immigration can be good. We're, we're a nation of immigrants, and even now, uh, we can accept and should accept, and we even want need for our own economy, some immigration. But our immigration policy should be in our best interest as a nation. We should have rules, and we should follow those rules. People should follow the law, and uh, people should come here to adopt our values, not to destroy our values. So I think reasonable laws that will maintain our integrity as a nation and meet our needs as a nation is what we have to consider first. Now, for those immigrants, especially coming from poor country countries, I was raised in Korea when it was a very poor country. I perfectly understand the motivation of people who want to come here, and I don't fault them as a father for wanting to provide for their families. Of course, I want them to follow the law, and I I want us to have guidelines for how much immigration we can reasonably accept. And I will say, I did visit the border, and I found a lot of the media presentation to be grossly exaggerated or erroneous. People were being treated humanely. Uh, Down at the Texas border, 85% of the population is Hispanic, and I would say a similar percentage uh, of our border uh, personnel are Hispanic as well. They're not trying to mistreat uh, fellow Hispanics. They like I expressed, they have a, a concern. They, they said, you know, I could, I could see myself in that situation. But yet, at the same time, they want to uphold the integrity of their own communities um, and of um, the American uh, way of life, American law. Uh, so, speaking as a citizen, we need to have laws and we need to enforce those laws. If they need to be changed, well, let's change them, but let's follow the law. And let's preserve our culture and our society and our economy, our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, and all of that. Now, let me speak as a Christian. While all that is true, if someone comes across illegally, they still need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whether they're here legally or not, they're going to be better, and our country will be better if they're saved. Okay, so they're... if. So I believe we can't wait until they get legal status or we can't wait until they learn English. We have to find ways to reach out to everyone who is in our country, legally or illegally, whether they speak English, Spanish, or some other language. Because first of all, the gospel knows no boundaries. Um, Jesus Christ died for the whole world. So the whole world needs to be saved. Second of all, if these people are here for whatever reason and for however long and under whatever circumstances, as a nation, we're going to be better off if those people are following Jesus versus following some cult or getting involved with some gang or uh, their their lives being destroyed and uh, uh, living a sinful life. So we have every motivation to try to save them. Now, once they're saved, we can talk to them about ethics and about trying to go through the process to legalize their status or, or consider what they need to do to make things right. Uh, but but even there, we have to understand that uh, most of these people are not coming as criminals. Most of them are coming for a better life, and we can respect that and sympathize with that. Um, that. That doesn't mean they're morally wrong to want that, although we need to guide them into the proper ways to do so. Uh, but we're not the law enforcement agents ourselves as the church, so it's not our job to go round up people and try to force them to leave. It's our job to win them. Uh, to see them saved, to see them discipled, and then, uh, you know, God can help them find out what is the best thing to do for their lives. Uh, And so, um, from that point of view, could it be, uh, you know, God can take bad things and bring good out of them? So, could it be that God will use this opportunity to see many souls saved, and even some of them will return to their countries and 
and help win their families and start churches. So God can take evil and turn it into good, or God can take a negative situation and turn it into good. So I'll conclude by saying as citizens, we ought to promote and vote for, for reasonable policies that we think are best for our nation. But then as church members, we still have a responsibility to, to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter who they are. Amen. The Apostolic Pentecostal Church is known uh, to much of the world by our traditions. Uh, the world is changing quickly. Uh, in a lot of ways, the Apostolic Church is changing. Uh, some among us in the Apostolic Movement uh, consider our changes to be an exercise of wisdom, while there are those among us who consider some of the changes uh is being compromised and even destructive. But it seems to be that a lot of the conflict that we see uh, in the apostolic movement revolves around tradition uh, more so than salvific doctrine. Uh, many believe that our non-biblical traditions are hurting uh, our ability to reach out to the lost, uh, and they believe that much of our tradition uh, isn't translating very well in the 21st century, what are your thoughts on how we can honor tradition without allowing it to be a point of contention and without it allowing uh, a hindrance uh, in our ability to reach out uh, to a 21st century society with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, let me give you a short answer and then I'll elaborate. The short answer is we must go by the Bible. That's the word of God. And we must be free and allow um, Christian liberty in areas that are not covered by the Bible. Uh, I would go back to Romans chapter 14. If something is a biblical teaching, if something deals with a morality, then obviously we all need to follow the teaching of the Bible. But if something is morally neutral, then we have liberty to make different choices. And we, Within the church, we should respect one another's choices. We should not ridicule or condemn people for different choices. Now, as apostolics, we, when it comes to doctrine, we preach the full deity of Jesus Christ, the oneness of God, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, receiving the Holy Ghost with the sign of speaking in tongues. And for, for many traditional denominations, some of these teachings are unknown or shocking or seem to be you know breaking tradition. And our response has always been, we, while we might respect tradition, we always must go by the Word of God. And the Word of God, the Bible, trumps tradition. That's what apostolics have always said. Now, we have to follow that in our own lives because while the apostolic movement as an organized movement, the Pentecostal movement, uh, is a little over 100 years old, of course, we believe it goes back to the New Testament and has appeared throughout history. But but our own organizations as such here in the United States, we have a history of, of a little over 100 years. But in that time, we've developed some of our own traditions, such as the way we preach, the music that we use, our manner of dress and appearance and uh, other things, the way we conduct church services, um, the way we structure local churches. Now, once again, if something is biblical, then we need to follow it regardless of the culture or the tradition. And some of the teachings that we have, such as gender distinction between male and female in hair and dress and modesty of dress and avoiding um, excessive ornamentation, so those are biblical teachings. So I would not really regard those merely as tradition. But there are some other things, uh, such as how we dress up for church and uh, some of the customs and practices that we have they're, if they're not explicitly rooted in the Bible, they're not an application of the teachings of the Bible, then we have to be free uh, to make different choices. And around the world, that's really already the case, because what is common in American culture may be uncommon or unknown in, say, a place where I grew up, Korea. And even some Pentecostal customs in the church may be completely different. So we can see that already happening around the world. We need to understand that's happening in our own culture in the United States. Uh, there's a generational change, and there's a cultural change. It, it's, it's typical that, I'll give you the example of music. 
if we're raised in church, then we identify with the with the type of music when we were when we were teenagers. And that's true of secular music too. We we tend to love the music when we became adults, and we all, that's our heart music. The same is true in the church. We love the music we're raised on that touched our heart. Or if we were converted as adults, then the music that was prevalent at that time really touches our heart. And so if we're an older person, a lot of modern music doesn't even touch our heart. It doesn't move us because it, it, it wasn't a part of our emotional conversion or upbringing. However, I, songs that just don't speak to me at all, I've watched teenagers and they're weeping and crying and, and responding and, and uh, praising God and dancing in the spirit. And I, I realized, you know what? That song really touched them. That song really meant to them, meant something. And, and so I think we have to be mature enough to say we will use different methods. Uh, and, of course, in the example of music, I think if you're an established church, a mixture of the old and new is probably the best. So you can appeal to different people. And, and the same way, there's styles of music. They appeal, appeal to different cultures, different races. And so maybe a mixture is the best if you want to have uh, a church that reaches the whole community. I, use, I simply use that as an example to say we must be willing to change our traditions or our methods without changing our doctrine or our biblical lifestyle of holiness. So I'm not talking about changing Scripture but I'm talking about being willing to change traditions and methods. And even if we, let's say we are older and we're content with the way we are or our church is established and it's doing well, still we shouldn't judge or condemn another church or a, a younger person or a person in a different city that feels the need to adjust some of these things, okay? So even while we have liberty to do what we want, what we like, we should still give that liberty to others who want to do it a different way. And, and I would point to 1 Corinthians 9. The Apostle Paul had an extended discussion, which he concluded, I'm all things to all men that my, I might by all means win some. So he explained to Jewish people, I appeal to Jewish culture. To Gentile people, I did not try to appeal to Jewish law, but I appealed to the Gentiles. And you can, on their basis, with their culture, you can see this exactly when he preached in Athens in Acts 17. He did something that's shocking that some people would condemn if they didn't know it was Paul. But he actually quoted from pagan philosophers and poets to make a valid point that he could use to connect to his pagan listeners. Of course, then he led them to Jesus Christ. But the point is, he was willing to use these various cultural means uh, to Gentiles to try to win them. And so we need to think of ourselves as missionaries to our own culture. Now, for some of us, it's kind of sad because we think of America as being uh, basically established on Christian principles. And 50 years ago, most people were churchgoers. Most people believed in Jesus Christ. We had a commonality among most people. And that's largely gone now. And so as a nation, we're, we're saddened by it. And, and we might react defensively to say, no, I'm going to try to fight for all, not only the gospel, but all these traditions. Well, we have to realize we're in a secular world. We're in a, a, a much more diverse society and a younger generation that doesn't understand where older people are coming from. And while that may be sad, it's the reality. So what are we going to do? Fight uh, everybody and withdraw within ourselves or reach out? Well, I say reach out. But to do that, we have to be like a missionary. So if I sent you as a missionary to China, you wouldn't expect everybody to learn English to understand you. You wouldn't expect to have a potluck dinner and have uh, American food. You would eat Chinese food. Uh, you wouldn't expect that they would play American-style music. You, they would have their music or wear American-style dress. They wear their dress. Well, that's kind of how we have to operate here. So when I have church and when I'm trying to start a new church and when I'm trying to minister to the lost, the number one question is not what makes me feel good, what am I most comfortable with, what am I most blessed by, but it's what's going to be most effective in reaching the people that I'm trying to reach. So I'm suggesting that we stand true to whatever the Scripture teaches, but we must be flexible and allow Christian liberty when it comes to non-biblical traditions, to when it comes to various styles and methods 
uh, we have to be willing to adjust in the 21st century. Amen. Apostolic Pentecostalism uh, has become somewhat of a denomination, like your Baptist, your Methodist, your Presbyterian. But it was not really, that was really not the, the purpose, that was really not the intent uh, of apostolic doctrine to just become another religion. Can you take just a moment and talk to our listeners about what apostolic Pentecostalism is, uh, the foundation of it, what what we believe, uh, and, and how apostolic Pentecostalism is rooted uh, in the, the doctrine of Jesus Christ? First of all, let me give you a definition. When we say Pentecostal, we're referring to an experience. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2, which is the birthday of the Christian church, where the believers were filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. So when we say Pentecostal, we're not really talking about a denomination. We're talking about an experience with God and a new way of life, of being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Of course, that should be for every Christian, but our distinctive way of understanding that and approaching that is what we call Pentecostal. So we could say we're Pentecostal in experience. When we say apostolic, that literally means like the apostles. And what we're saying there is our authority is the Bible, and more specifically for the church, our authority is the New Testament. And while we believe the whole Bible is instructive for us, the, 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 the church we're a part of was founded in the New Testament, so obviously the New Testament is going to be um, the foremost teacher. And even within the New Testament, we're looking at the church. The church was, was established upon Jesus Christ who's recorded his life and ministries in the four Gospels, but the church was actually started in the book of Acts. And, of course, the epistles in the book of Revelation were written to the church. So when, when, it, when it comes to what should we preach, teach, experience, how should we live, what are our instructions, we find that in the, in the New Testament, in the teaching and preaching of the 12 apostles and the apostle Paul. God used them, Jesus chose them to found the church. So we should be like them. So when we use the term apostolic, what we're simply saying is we shouldn't go primarily by our tradition or the creeds or the councils or the popes or whatever happened over the last 2,000 years. But first and foremost, for every significant question, what should we preach? What should we teach? What should we experience? What should we promote as the norm or the standard? How should we live? We have to go back to the first century church, to the preaching and teaching of the apostles as recorded in the New Testament. So we're apostolic in our doctrine, and we're Pentecostal in our experience. Now, what I've just explained is not a denomination per se. However, I will hasten to add, the New Testament shows that uh, each local church was organized in its city and it was self-governing but also each local church was connected to other churches, and they worked together for revival. So I do believe in the principle of organization, uh, if you want to call it a denomination. I do believe in the, in the principle of having an organized effort. Um, but as you've indicated, um, this message far transcends any one organization or, or any human religion or human denomination, because religions are, are humans searching for God, whereas true salvation is God searching for humans and us responding to him. So I would summarize by saying everyone, no matter who you are and whether you're raised Baptist or Catholic or some or, or Pentecostal or non-religious, I think all of us need to, to worship the one true God. We need to recognize Jesus Christ as God manifest in the flesh to be our Lord and Savior and we need to respond to him and receive the experiences found in the New Testament church, which includes being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that's what apostolic Pentecostals stand for, and they believe it's for everyone. And no matter what the name of your church or how what religion you were raised in, it's an experience and a way of life and a relationship with God that's for everyone. Amen. You have written a catalog uh, of material 
Uh, how many books have you published? Oh, I think uh, it's over 30. I think maybe 37 at this point, including some booklets. Okay. So can you take just a moment and uh, tell our listeners how they can go about uh, acquiring some of the books you have written? And can you give us some of the topics and, and different things uh, that you've written on that, that may be of interest to our listeners? Sure. Well, first of all, all of my books are available from the Pentecostal Publishing House. And so the easiest way to get there is PentecostalPublishing.com. So you go to that one website and you can search for me or you can search for my books. Pentecostal, um, P-E-N-T-E-C-O-S-T-A-L, uh, publishing.com. And all my books are in print and many of them, most of them are also ba- available digitally. Uh, so some might also be available at they're also available at Amazon and other places, but but PentecostalPublishing.com has everything. Uh, it depends on what you're interested in. So if you'd like an introduction to what it means to be Pentecostal, what what is our basic teaching and experience, there's a small book called On Being Pentecostal, and that would be a good introduction. Uh, if you want just a brief doctoral introduction that um, I have a booklet called Essential Doctrines of the Bible. That gives you a brief overview. And then I've written, most of my books are, are doctrinal, so if you're interested in, in specific topics, the oneness of God, the new birth, in search of holiness. Uh, also, some books of a more general nature, um, if you want to know why you why the Bible is God's Word and how we can trust the text that we have today. Um, I've written a book called God's Infallible Word. Um, if you're interested in the gifts of the Spirit and how they operate in the life of believers, in the life of the church, uh, miracles for today, uh, I have a book called Spiritual Gifts. Um, and then my latest book is completely different. It's autobiographical. It tells some of my early experiences in Korea and my travel around the world to co- communist countries, Muslim countries, uh, even countries I don't name because of security concerns, uh, and talk about some of the miracles, some of the uh, uh, narrow escapes uh, from, uh, when I was ministering under communism. Uh, and that book is called To the End of the Earth, uh, and that's my missionary stories. So that just gives you a sampling. Uh, I also have books on church history and uh, books on various Bible subjects. Uh, I have a master's and doctor's thesis for those that are interested in scholarship. I, I might mention that my master's thesis is called Justification in the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's on salvation, and my doctoral thesis is called The Glory of God in the Face of Jesus Christ. It's on the identity of Jesus Christ. So that kind of gives you a variety of what's available. Bishop Bernard, we know you're a busy man, and we want to thank you for taking time to uh, answer these important questions for us and uh, for uh, speaking with our listeners. and uh... The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, 
Walk in the new life. Study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful.